Disclaimer time. This is where I tell everyone to lighten up. It's just a podcast. Trading is like that roller coaster at the amusement park. Thrilling, unpredictable, and potentially stomach churning. What works for one person might leave another clutching their hat in the wind. Our hosts and guests, they're awesome, knowledgeable, full of insights, but we're not financial advisors. So don't rush to make any investment decisions based solely on our banter. Always consult with a professional or do your own research. Plus, let's face it, we like to have fun, laugh, and enjoy the trading ride together. It's all in the name of good podcasting fun. So remember, take it easy, don't bet the farm, and keep your seatbelts on at all times. Thank you for listening. All right, hello, outliers and bulls, and welcome back to the China Shop, home of the Band of Traders podcast. Joining me, of course, today is our good friend, Eric Smolinski of ES Invests. Last time we met, we reviewed the data I started collecting for a couple different earnings strategies, and Eric also tasked me with adding 0.3, 0.2, and 0.1 Delta straddles to my data set. Sorry, Delta strangles to my data set. Uh, if that sentence just made your head spin, then you probably want to listen to the series in order as we've been building upon the lessons learned in previous episodes. I'll make sure we have a link to the series page so you can easily find those recordings. And if you are following along or have questions, please reach out. All our contact info will be in the episode description. Also, we are recording video for these. Uh, be sure to include the links to that if you want to be able to see the screen shares. Well, it's not uh, so much uh, for the screen shares. It's mostly to be able to just gaze upon my greatness. Right. You want to give us a bicep? <laughs> Yeah, primarily. Maybe. <laughs> Hold on. Oh, is that Thor? This is Thor. Uh, it's actually I funny because I have the little blur thing set up. He likes my ears for some reason. It's a strange... Better than there your we toes. Go. I had to turn the blur off because he gets blurred out. What up, my dude? You're going to talk about some trading he? now? He's a Maltese poodle. Nice. Yeah. So he's ready to trade. <laughs> well, um, one thing that we've been, we just spent the last hour talking about what our plans are for moving the series forward. Um, we'd only planned on doing about eight episodes of these or so when we first started out. Uh, so we're kind of running up towards the end now. I don't know. Do you want to kind of talk about what we, what we discussed there or where we landed? No. <laughs> <laughs> I, I like the idea of trying to move this into some a more of a live environment and getting uh, more people interacting. I think that's a solid idea. I like the idea of continuing on discussing like the things that we're learning or maybe having some more specific topics that we can dive into. But really just the idea of opening it up to more people really, I think, makes a ton of sense. Yeah. So what we were talking about is shifting, hosting it from kind of Kyle's platform, and then we're going to pick it up and move it over to my platform on YouTube Live, really for that purpose. Mm -hmm. We explored uh, Twitch streaming, and since neither of us have cleavage or playing video games, we didn't think it would fit there super well. And then Kyle will determine, you know, if there's segments that he can repurpose on his side. But yeah, I think overall... One of the cool things about being able to do this live, I I love interacting with people live. It's my favorite. It literally is my favorite. So it gives us a chance to kind of capitalize on that, continue the series that we started. But then also one of my personal objectives for content in 2024 was to start building more beginner level content, which I'm not even going to lie. Most of what I put out now, I would consider to be like pretty entry level. But then when people told me that, like, they don't think that, it's really good feedback for me to then understand, okay, I need to reconfigure a little bit of what I'm putting out there so that I'm meeting kind of the, the need for people. That's the whole point. Mm -hmm. And as I'm noticing more and more beginner options traders are kind of coming into my net and they're not sure on where to start. So the idea for the segment going forward is that we would pick up where we left off on the optional experience segment and then we would kind of start the um, live trading workshop. We're going to work the branding a little bit, but it'll essentially be a live segment. And the idea there is we might have a focused topic each week. We might not. It depends on what's going on in the markets at that point in time. But we want to spend time reviewing trade ideas, again, live, so that people can ask questions. If you have a specific thesis or concept that you want us to talk about, again, live, it'll be there. And then the other beautiful part about hosting it on YouTube Live is that it is available then as a recording for the people that weren't able to catch it. 
Yep. So yeah, I'm, I love the idea. I think it'll fit well with at least both of our broader content production schedules, but then it'll give both of our audiences a chance, one, to meet one another and co-mingle because I think that would be really good for all of them. There's not, it's not too frequent where I think a lot of online finance communities are full of like really cool people, but I genuinely believe both of our communities are exactly that. So it'll offer a chance for them to commingle a little bit, but then also to get more close flash to bang, as we would say in the military, you know, if you have a flashbang grenade, it goes flash bang. Mm -hmm. um, the idea is to get those two very close to one another, at least in this case, so that learning can occur at a more rapid rate, which is also why, as I previously said, we were looking to do this on a weekly cadence as compared to a bi-weekly cadence. The sessions will be a little bit shorter, but anything that I've ever read about neuroplasticity or the concepts of accelerating our learning curve, being around whatever we're trying to learn more frequently is there's no substitute for that. Mm -hmm. So I think by having shorter periods, but more frequent will work really well for people. So we're looking at starting to host on Tuesday evenings so that most people are off work at that time and should be able to join in. And I'm, super stoked i think this is gonna be yeah. really fun this is the stuff i like to do i i'm really looking forward to it i think that there's a lot of people that i think are going to be really excited and can learn a lot from from the stuff that we can do here yeah i think it'll be uh, dope. all right well what should we do today then since uh i guess it's kind of our last time doing it like this yeah i actually think a couple things would be cool here the first thing would be to interview you a little bit on your experience and my hope here is to offer people that might be joining us in the middle some ideas on what we've learned some of the specific difficulty points that you might have had and then kind of get an idea of what going forward looks like for us so to start us I would love to hear just a synopsis of the experience for you, mostly in terms of the information. Was the information in line with expectations? Were you finding things more difficult or easier than you expected? Is there more or less complexity in the overall um, skill set that you're learning? Stuff like that. Well, the the ideas that you're that you had us looking into, like the different options, structures, and like the theories behind it, like none of that was over my head. I, I would say the actual practice of trying to figure out what is the important things to track in order to build good data sets, in order to have some confidence to execute these strategies, I think is the point where I've been having a little bit more trouble. Uh, I've got a big list of data, but it's so disorganized right now that I think the next, my plan for the rest of this week is to go through and try to figure out a way to put some structure into that to where I can actually make use of it. But that's been my biggest hurdle so far, I think. And I think for you specifically, looking at your previous trading logs, I, I don't know if you remember, but I picked up on that already. Mm -hmm. That I think the way that you organize stuff, sometimes it looks pretty, but I don't think it's always super usable. So that would be uh, actually a really great beginner topic for when mm -hmm. we do the live session, the first one next week, is we can talk about like structuring data. Because like I was telling you, not everybody is going to be quite as much of like a, I'm an organization freak. And right. the reason why I do that is because it really optimizes efficiency. I, I'm organized in everything. I've always been this way. And it's just because everything is simpler. I never have to look for things. I can find things easily. I know how to manipulate data that's clean, stuff like that. So that's led to me building a massive data set. I've created my own tables uh, that I can query against. I created essentially an entire stack to house market data. But I acknowledge a lot of people aren't necessarily going to do that. And to be honest, you probably don't have to. I just am fascinated by this stuff. So what we can do in your case, I think, is take a look at how you're organizing now, because that is one benefit you do have, is that you have good organization and that you track a lot of things and you're disciplined about it. So that part is a great starting point, in my opinion, whereas most people are just super lazy about tracking. So that's yeah. a whole other problem. And honestly, it's like, fuck those guys. But 
I well, think... I, uh, that's tough because I had trouble with that too initially when I first sure. started out. But I think the... I think it's once you start to see the benefit of it, like once you start right. like being able to like modify your strategies and improve and you really start to see the value, it snowballs and you get more excited. You want to collect more and you want to do more of it. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. And to me, I think there's a balance. I think that we should use things like paper trading to amplify a data set, but paper trading for an initial data set is awful. Yeah. because it's slow it's time intensive i actually have a video coming out soon i don't know exactly when it'll drop because it's still getting edited and i honestly have videos already planned out through the end of the year i might have to reconfigure a little bit but it's essentially about um how to create an option strategy and i have a relatively recent one that maybe could suffice in the meantime but the reason why I talk about this is because the idea of creating an option strategy is not quite as simple as think about arbitrary rules that you don't really believe one way or the other because they're arbitrary and then just test them live and see how they do. That's not a great approach to this. So the idea is, in my opinion, to leverage things like back testing first, then you can forward test and mm -hmm. then you can paper trade, which is the highest fidelity version of this. And then you can trade it live, something like that. Mm -hmm. So we can walk through that process together, which I think is a good exercise for anybody. I think if anybody is trading options and is not doing that, they're making a giant mistake, just hands down. I would agree with that. Yeah. Um, let's see, any other issues that have come up? Um, the actual data collection um, I remember last time we talked, you talked about the think back function of, of thinkorswim mm -hmm. and I was trying to make some use of that, but I don't know if you've seen where like, it'll say like the same data for like the 25th and the 26th. So it can be, yeah, it can be quirky like that. It's not always accurate. And I also noticed that it has a lot of issues with leveraged ETFs where mm. like whatever specific day you're on it'll have a insane price. So like yesterday it would have been 20 bucks and today it's 240 bucks. And then if you fast <laughs> forward another day, the day before was actually $22, whatever the fuck. So there's a ton of quirks with them. The main benefit in my opinion of using something like think back is the ability to see a market that you're genuinely unfamiliar with and then to conduct analysis in that market. Again, provided that the product is behaving as it should, but then a lot of the more liquid things, they do work well. So if you're trading like SPY or IWM or the big index ETFs themselves, I don't notice a lot of issues with those. Well, I was so seeing with like it, things like NVIDIA and Microsoft and I was, cause I yeah. thought, oh, I'll just go back and get three months worth of, or three different cycles of earnings rather than just waiting for the next one to happen. And I was finding two or three occurrences in a three week period regularly for both of them. Right. Yeah. Individual stocks. I yeah. think that that sounds about right. Um, and that's when traders have to make a decision, right? There, there are shortfalls with free data. That's what yeah. it comes down to. It's free data. That's insanely convenient. So it's not going to be perfect because they're not making a bunch of money on it. Well, if, the, the, I guess the real question for me was, do I trust that data then? Right. And you can assess that for yourself because you can take a look at what it's telling you. Mm -hmm. And then you can go back and look at it on not, not in think back, but on the chart. That's what I would do. Okay. And then it will give you something to validate against so mm -hmm. that when you are looking in think back, you could see, okay, uh, price actually shot up. So I know volatility is going to contract in that scenario. I know that the call is going to get challenged if you're doing like a short uh, strangle. I know the put's going to be clear and then you can go back into think back. And make sure that it matches. Now. Exactly. And make sure that it worked as it should have. It's okay. again, it's why that's the last stage in testing is because it's the highest fidelity view. It's very time intensive. Even that, that I just talked through kind of that yeah. quickly, that takes time. You got to go back and forth and then it's got to load. It's not quick. That's why it's so important in my opinion, to be efficient the way that we choose to test strategies. And it's exactly why I tend to start with, back testing, forward testing, then paper trading slash using on demand, something like that. Just kind of as a general note for people, because if you start just using on demand to create a data set, 
it helps. And I, I literally have trades on, not in on demand, I kind of call it paper trading. I just use the live platform. And then if I'm placing a trade or if I'm testing a trade, I just have it all in Excel where I'll mm -hmm. test all different variations of the same thing. And I'll just do that simultaneously with my live trading. So doing it live, I think it gives you a lot of high fidelity information as long as it's something that you continue doing going forward. Mm -hmm. But this is not a great spot to start testing something by itself because yep. it's very time intensive. Yep. Yeah, so building out a bigger data set, I think, is kind of the spot where I'm at right now. I want to have the confidence to be able to put real money behind these trades and not be afraid of uh, being like a short of straddle going into earnings. Like for the yeah. those types of like the, the one in a million type scenarios that can wipe you out. And, and that's the other thing is like if that is a genuine concern of yours in that kind of there's nothing wrong with trading a short iron fly. Mm -hmm. Just buy the wings. It's yeah. going to cause some drag on the returns. It's not as much of a pure play, but it eliminates that risk. So then that's no longer a primary concern that you have. To me, that's worth the $10 you might pay to put the wings on, mm -hmm. hands down. Like, And I've told you guys this before. Like, There's plenty of things I still will trade that way. Right. And it's right. just because of that same concept. It's not purely efficient, but I might recognize something can move. Mm -hmm. So I will take that trade off every single time. So for somebody like you, especially for your first earning cycle, I honestly think putting the wings on is super logical. Yep. Because the other thing that can happen is if you have a bad run of earnings, it can really get you out before you even start. If you have like four or five bad earnings in a row with these big moves, you really don't want to put another one on. Mm -hmm. So if you can ease some of that, I think it's wise, personally. Yep. And honestly, I think the one that I think speaks more to me is actually the lead up to earnings. Like that's the trade that I've been more excited about developing and, and trying to flesh out the volatility expansion leading into earnings. Yeah, I think there's a lot of different ways you can test that. Mm -hmm. It's difficult to get it in a vacuum because the markets are still moving. Yep. But it's a it's yeah it's a good thing to test um those are the main struggles i think right now uh really it's just trying to get the time to go collect the data and making sure that i'm effectively using that time that i have like i want to make sure that the data i'm collecting is actually going to be worthwhile good so then since you're now on options pro if <laughs> there is a product that has low volatility Mm -hmm. expressed as a low implied volatility percentile. First, what does implied for volatility percentile tell me? Percentile? I'm not sure. But you're an options pro. You know this already. Apparently not. Uh, I mean, that should tell you that... Apparently the... not. <laughs> <laughs> if you're low IV, that should mean that it's less likely to move. It should be... It should have tighter ranges. The price itself should be a little more stable. But what about implied volatility percentile? I would assume that's where it ranks relative to either its peers or its history, but I have no clue. How do you differ? Okay, so this is good. Mm -hmm. And this is one of the really common ways to visualize implied volatility. So implied volatility, there's two different metrics that you can take a look at. There's IV rank, and then there's IV percentile. And I actually, I don't think I got rid of it. Let me see. Which one is on the charts? Because I think that's the one I've been looking at. You've been looking at raw IV. Okay. Yes, just IV yeah. compared to so, historical. Yeah. So here's, I'm dropping it in the chat for you. Okay. I wonder if I can play one of my own videos and not get a copyright strike. I'm actually, <laughs> I think, I think, I think we should try it. I, so... Let me, I'm going to share my screen with you. This is hilarious because I could tell this is a uh, OG COVID Eric. I'm pretty eager here. This is, uh, <laughs> this is OG early days. Oh, wow. Check that, check that out. How long ago was that? This is from August, 2020. Damn. So yeah, so this is right when COVID had been in swing for a minute. You can't get a haircut. 
Right. And this is what you look like. You look like a fucking hoodlum. <laughs> so I'm going to turn on, let me know if you can hear this audio. Does nope. that come through to you at all? Okay, that's no problem. So anyways, I we don't need to see this anyways. I want to show you the difference between IV rank and IV percentile. So to your point, both of these indicators give us a sense of how the current implied volatility is behaving against itself looking back 52 weeks. Okay. So over the past year. Now, IV rank is very prone to what we would call outlier skew. Mm -hmm. And here's why. It calculates in the IV rank by taking the current implied volatility less the 52 week IV low, and then it divides it by the 52 week IV high less the two 52 week IV low. So overall, a pretty standard practice for us to rank something against itself. We're so just using the basically just looking at where it is right now in the range that it has had over the past year. Exactly, relative yep. to itself. Yep. Okay. Now, if we look at implied volatility, this is very different. It takes the number of trading days below the current IV and it divides it by 252. Oh. So this is not using a range of high and low. The reason why this matters is because if we have a crazy month or day where the 52 week high is astronomically high, this will impact this calculation until it falls off right. because it's using the extreme. Whereas IV percentile is using the number of days. So that tends to get normalized by itself because you can still have that crazy one big day, but then the following days, if it contracts, it's not going to skew things anywhere near as much. And in the example that I have here, IV rank versus IV percentile is there's a big variance between these two in this example, mm -hmm. at least. Mm -hmm. And that's just showing how different calculations can skew things to give you a less realistic assessment of things. So that's typically why I use implied volatility percentile versus okay. implied volatility rank is that it uses the number of trading days as compared to the range high low. And then the, just the raw implied volatility. What is, what is the, what is that? Yeah, great question. So implied volatility is a 30 day forward looking forecast. So it's assessing what it thinks market volatility will be for 40 or 30 days looking forward. And the way that implied volatility works, there's this is actually a really interesting concept because a lot of people, they think that if you run through a surface model, and you calculate your own volatility, they'll still call that implied volatility and it's not. What implied volatility is specifically is when we're implying the volatility from options prices where we're deriving whatever the implied volatility is. So if you take a look at the current premium of an option, you can derive the volatility from that current options premium, that's the implied volatility. And that's a forward projection of expected volatility. And so why why not use the raw? What is the difference between the raw and the percentile then? Or why would one be better than the other? I wouldn't say either of those to be the case. I wouldn't okay. use one or the other, and I wouldn't say one is better than the other. I think they both give us different data points. Mm -hmm. So if we see implied volatility right now, I'm looking at Celsius just because it's up. Implied volatility right now is 48.23%. Is that high or low for Celsius? Hang on, I'm trying to pull it up too. Sure. What's the stock ticker? C E L H. So volatility right now, just the raw volatility is what? 0.48 versus a historical of 0.1757. So I'd be looking at that a week ago and thinking, okay, implied volatility is higher than historical. But in terms of implied volatility itself, is that high or low? I mean, how can you say that without something to compare it to? That's exactly why implied volatility percentile is so useful. That okay, right there. Okay. So it's giving... something to compare it to. 
So right. in this case, CELH, if you look at the implied volatility percentile, it's 16%. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you can see relative to its past year of volatility, it's actually quite low. That means just 41 days out of 252 or lower mm -hmm. than it currently is right now. So it's very low. That sounds very useful. Bingo. Okay. That's right. And that's the exact Sold. thing that we used to compare it to. <laughs> All right. So volatility percentile. Um, I have any other questions? What about historical volatility then? Does that have any other fancy ones that I should be looking at? Does it have any percentiles or ranks? Or can you just use so, the number that pops up on the chart when you look at the historical? Yeah, that's essentially you can use moving averages for that, right? Okay. So if you use a 252-day moving average, it's using the last 252 days to tell you what the average price was. That's also why I like using linear regression channels is because for different aggregation periods, it informs me how it currently is sitting compared to itself over whatever that aggregation period is. So that's the cool part about historic volatility is that you can just see it on a chart, essentially. Mm -hmm. Like that's what you're seeing is HD. Yeah. And you can use different moving averages for different time frames. You can also calculate it like we do, right, in that little bottom indicator. The, the world of forward-looking and past-looking volatility is really curious because you can have historic volatility, realized volatility, which sound the same, but they're not, and then you can have future realized volatility, which is like, what the fuck is that? And then you can have implied volatility. Like there's a lot of different quirks to all the volatility stuff. What I tell people is when you're looking at stuff in the past, you're best off calling it historic volatility because that's always accurate. But you can have realized volatility that's actually forward looking, which is future realized volatility. It's just completely different. You know... <laughs> With the many different ways of looking at and analyzing volatility, it seems like it should be something that's very, very important to us as options traders. It is literally the only reason to trade options. Yeah. Which is hilarious to me because most people don't even know all of these different versions exist. It's I literally didn't. <laughs> it's it's literally comical to me. Mm -hmm. Well, and nobody talks about it. So I mean, you asked me for like what I've learned or what I've enjoyed about the series that we've done so far. It's learning things like these, like the actual things that really matter and not just somebody trying to sell me a bunch of stupid indicators or alert signals. I do have this really cool indicator where if I wake up in the morning with a heart on, it might be a good day. You could buy that if you want. All right. They should put that on a shirt. <laughs> <laughs> all right do we have uh anything else you want to cover here before we wrap this up no sir i'm all stoked right. for getting this going on a on a live series going forward for everybody that's interested in attending we're looking at doing these on tuesdays at 4 30 p.m pacific time we said yep so, so 6 30 central 7 30 eastern yep so the idea is that should be good for most people. If it's not good for you for some reason, just let us know because we can slide a little bit left or right to try to accommodate more folks. If a little bit is good for you, um, that's cool. You know, we'll we'll figure out the best time, but we think that's a good time to start. Yep. And then the sessions are expected to run somewhere around 30 minutes, less than 45 minutes. It won't go over that. And we will kind of hit them every single week. So it'll be a good chance if, especially if you're a beginner to be around this stuff around people that are talking about it regularly because that is a great way to pick it up if you're trying to learn a new language the best thing you could do is go to that country and live among those people while you're learning the language this is the same exact thing we're trying to offer to you guys here yeah and if you can't afford to travel then marry somebody from there mm. so no, if they can wait. talk shit about you <laughs> in a language you can't understand love that exactly <laughs> at least a lot less fights all right i think that's going to do it for today so thanks everyone stuck around to the bitter end uh special thanks to eric for just giving away all this hard-earned knowledge we will be back soon with another installment likely on that youtube channel uh but until then remember that every time you like one of these episodes a content creator gets a boner nope oh, fuck hang on sorry my script is supposed to say wings there you've been editing my shit again
This podcast is intended for informational and educational purposes only. It does not constitute financial or investment advice and should not be construed as such. The hosts, guests, and contributors of this podcast are not licensed financial advisors, brokers, or professionals. Any trading or investment decisions made based on the content of this podcast are solely at the listener's discretion and risk. Trading and investing in financial markets carry inherent risks and past performance is not indicative of future results. Listeners should conduct their own research and seek advice from qualified financial professionals before making any financial decisions. The views, opinions, and information shared in this podcast are those of the individual contributors and do not necessarily reflect the views or policies of the podcast creators or associated organizations. Produced by China Shop Productions.